Welcome everyone to the November 2021 Foreign Policy Leadership Council special presentation. My name is Carol Macari. I'm Assistant Professor of Management at University of Cincinnati and the Vice President of the organization. For the ones of you who are not familiar with Foreign Policy Leadership Council, we are a nonprofit organization made up of volunteers who are interested in foreign policy as it impacts our region, our nation, and our world. The mission of FPLC, as we call it, is to bring foreign policy to the grassroots so that an informed citizenry can enrich understanding of global matters. It combines discussion with roundtable meals to encourage networking of a diverse audience. Topics are broad ranging, covering the Middle East, the Baltics, trade, drones, biomedical engineering, climate change, military and security matters, China, India, and many other subjects. We believe that foreign policy cannot be left to the experts in the world's capitals, but needs the perspectives from beyond the beltway. For today's presentation, we have the pleasure and the honor to have a dear friend of mine, Mr. Tom Schramm, who will re run a presentation on Afghanistan from his very deep perspe perspective. Tom Schramm holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from the United States Naval Academy, class of 1969. Tom also has an MBA degree in Marketing and Finance from the Schindler School of Business, University of Hawaii. He was commissioned in a Navy's restricted line and served seven and a half years as a Special Intelligence Officer in the Naval Security Group. He was stationed in both Japan and Okinawa while serving on multiple deployments. In 1973, he was assigned to NSGA Anchorage, Alaska at executive officer. He resigned his commission in late 1976. His specialty was electronic intelligence collection while service, serving in the Naval Security Group. He played a role in the Saigon evacuation in 1975. After leaving the Navy, he had an eclectic career starting with Procter & Gamble where he worked in manufacturing, research and development, advertising, brand management, and sales. Tom's innovative approach in each of these endeavor, endeavors led to patents and unique business opportunities. However, he never lost his interest in discovering and publishing about world events. Most recently, Tom played a direct role in assisting 763 Afghan refugees flee in the recent aftermath of the Taliban takeover and is now currently assisting another group of refugees who desperately need to evacuate Afghanistan. For the ones of you who would like to see more and read more about the Foreign Policy Leadership Council, please go to our website, fplcohio.org, where you can also read the news. You can see some of the events that we have been presenting, and then you also can subscribe to our monthly newsletter. Without further ado, I would like to transfer the podium to our to my good friend, Tom Shen. Thanks very much, Kat, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, and thank you to the Foreign Policy Leadership Council of Ohio for the kind invitation. I've been very interested in Afghanistan ever since 9-11, when my good friend and classmate, Kevin Connors from the United States Naval Academy died in the World Trade Center. I've followed it carefully, and especially so over the last five years as activity over there began to wind down. Uh, I began in earnest supporting Afghanistan efforts on September 2nd, and to date we've managed to get 763 uh, high value uh, targets, at least in the Taliban's eyes, out. The intent of this session is to give you a general overview of the history of Afghanistan so that you have some context so that when I uh, have a discussion about the evacuation efforts uh, in late August, uh, the efforts to get refugees out, and what is going to happen in the future, at least from my perspective, you understand the background in which I'm making those comments. I would encourage you to get a, a piece of paper or something to write on and something to write with, because at the end of the session, I will be providing you uh, with a website if you have a desire to make a contribution to the families. 
that I've been working to get out. There are 22 family members that'll come later. And also, if you'd like to join the distribution group that I call my in Intel group, it's free. Uh, I have over, uh, I have several hundred people that are on the list. And if you'd like to join that, uh, then all you have to do is send me an email. Uh, there'll be more on that information letter later. Let's get right into it and let's talk about why Afghanistan is impossible to conquer and control. This first uh, map that Kat is going to put up shows the geography of Afghanistan. And as is clearly evident here, Afghanistan is landlocked. You have Iran to the west, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan to the north, China in the northeast, which is a very narrow corridor of 47 miles. It also happens to be at 16,000 feet. So there's not a whole lot of uh, uh, activity across the border there. And then you have Pakistan to the east and the south. Pakistan has basically been at war for centuries and they've been conquered by some of the greats, uh, Greece, Genghis Khan, Persia, Alexander the Great, Russia, and then of course the United States. One of the things that plays a terrific role in Afghanistan is the topography. And this next uh, map that Kat's going to put up shows just how important topography is in Afghanistan. 75% of Afghanistan is considered mountainous. The Hindu Kush, you know, start in the southwest of Afghanistan and then go to the northeast, ranging from about 5,000 feet above sea level to over 18,000 feet above sea level. These huge mountains that you can see in the dark spots here uh, on the map function as walls. They keep enemies out and they also create fertile valleys in between the mountains where most of the people live. Over history, the countryside has been largely self-managed. And fundamentally, Afghanistan is a tribal society. They have no loyalty to any central government and they depend on their village and their clan or their tribe for support and protection from enemies. One of the most critical borders here is the Afghanistan-Pakistan border. And that runs right through the Pashtun tribal area. And this next map is going to really make that clear because it shows the Durand Line. The Durand Line came into being in the late 1800s after the UK had invaded Afghanistan and then decided they were going to pull out. Pakistan was then part of India and they created this border, which no one has ever formally accepted, but it is used uh, with maps to delineate the difference between Pakistan and Afghanistan. Russia invaded from the North in 1979. This invasion was seen as a hypocrisy and uh, an assault against Islam because Russia, of course, is communist and they're godless. The Afghans hated them. The Russian invasion gave rise to the group called the Mujahideen, and they were headquartered in the Pakistani administered Northwest Territories that you can see here uh, right at the end of the Blue Arrow. The money to support the Mujahideen came from the Haqqani network. And this came to the Haqqani network via the ISI or the uh, internal, uh, internal Support Intelligence Agency of the Pakistani military. Pakistan and the United States supported the Mujahideen with dollars to purchase weapons, and then also the actual weapons themselves. 
One of the most famous weapons were the Stinger missiles used to, to shoot down Russian helicopters. The fierce resistance that the Mujahideen put up resulted in Russia getting stuck in a nine-year war, and they ultimately left and retreated in 1989 without success, leaving behind a puppet communist government headquartered in Kabul that did not have a whole lot of power. From 1989 to 1986, there was a civil war in Pakistan that ebbed and flowed with the communist puppet government in Kabul being the uh, protagonist on the communist side. In 1992, the Iron Curtain fell and the USSR, which you can see here to the north, became Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan. The Taliban came into rule in 1996. One of the things that happened when the Taliban took over were that other terrorists fighting the so-called Great Satan in the United States were welcomed into Afghanistan, including Al-Qaeda. The only holdout in the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan were the Northern Alliance. And this next map will show you where the Northern Alliance was headquartered. It was the Northern Alliance that the United States turned to after 9-11. On September 15th, President Bush gave the Taliban an ultimatum. Expel Al-Qaeda or the United States was going to invade. They didn't expel Al-Qaeda and we invaded. And we invaded via the Northern Alliance. We fought a deadly insurgency for the next 18 years. Osama bin Laden was finally killed uh, in May of 2011. And in 2019, President Bush, or I'm sorry, President Trump began negotiations with the Taliban that had preconditions and ongoing conditions that would ultimately result in the United States removing most of its troops in 2021 if the Taliban met certain criteria. The Battle of Tora Bora, which you can see here on the map, was one of the seminal battles in the early goings of the Afghanistan war. It was here in the mountainous region of Tora Bora that Osama bin Laden had fled to and ultimately managed to escape into Pakistan after this 13 day battle. And then sought protection and as almost everyone knows, hid in a safe house in uh, uh, in, Afga in Pakistan until we, in Abbottabad, until we were finally able to track him down and take him out via the SEAL raid in May of 2011. In 2021, after President Biden took over, it was his stated plan to get US troops out of Afghanistan. The Department of Defense wanted to maintain a force of 2,500 to 3,500 troops at Bagram Air Base for air support, special operations support, intelligence gathering, and monitoring. President Biden decided that that was not something he wanted to do. And in April, of 2021 declared that the US would be out of Afghanistan no later than September 11th, the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attack. The Taliban began their final push to take over Afghanistan in May of 2021. And by August 15th, they controlled the entire country, including Kabul. During the month of August, the U.S. evacuated about 120,000 people from Hamid Karzai International Airport or Kabul International Airport. 
80,000 of these Afghans who were evacuated had no papers, no passports, and were basically from the street. And they wanted to get out of uh, Afghanistan because they feared what was going to happen when the Taliban took over. Unfortunately, for those who had made special immigrant visa applications and who were American citizens, American green card holders, or res uh, uh, others who had supported the United States could not get into Kabul International Airport because the Taliban took over the three gates that led into the airport. The American ethos, which has been in place since our country was founded, is leave no one behind. We did it again, just like we did in Vietnam, only worse. And we could have done an, a lot better. Taliban now control all of Afghanistan. Afghanistan is now called the IEA or the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. The Taliban are finding that managing the peace is much more difficult than fighting a guerrilla war, and it's not working very well. The ISI and Taliban leadership and members of the Akani network were the first people who landed in Kabul International after the United States pulled out on August, late in the night of August 30th. All Taliban government staffing is approved by the ISI and the Akhani network. The Taliban are desperate. They have no pay, they don't get food, and they have not been paid for six months. The law of the land is basically carried out by the Taliban foot soldiers. They go house to house, doing one of two things, begging for food and money, but also following up on their kill list, looking for judges, government officials, former military officers, former police, and they are the rule of law. The economy is in shambles. It was about a $20 billion economy for the 12 months preceding the Biden announcement that we were going to depart Afghanistan. That $20 billion was made up of 45% foreign aid and the balance from agriculture and limited in industry inside of Afghanistan. For comparison, here in Cincinnati, we have about 2 million people and the GDP for the greater Cincinnati area is about 150 billion annually. Now remember, Pakistan has 40 million people with a $20 billion economy, and that economy now has probably been reduced by about half. Opium makes up about $2 billion of the GDP, and it is growing, as is the growth of marijuana. You see, there was a huge drought in 2021, which has greatly hindered the Afghans' ability to harvest the wheat, barley, fruit, vegetables that they grow in the valleys, both as food for the internal population and for export. People are out of work, they're hungry, and it's estimated that 60 to 65% of all Afghans are going to be in food crisis or starving this winter. There's limited to no health care because that all collapsed as well when the Taliban took over. 25% of the population are heroin addicts. While the Taliban hate the drugs, they love the money. So does Pakistan, so does the ISI, so do the Pakistani banks who launder the money. Also internally, about 4 million people have been displaced by the Taliban. They've had their houses taken over, as was the case with the, the family that I've been working to get out of Afghanistan and taken over by the Taliban and occupied by the Taliban. Let's talk about the evacuation efforts since August 30th of 
2021. There are over 100 groups right now attempting to get people who are considered high value targets by the Taliban, who are uh, special immigrant uh, visa holders, who are American citizens, who are green card holders, who were former interpreters, who worked with the American military, government officials, judges. The Taliban agreed to let uh, humanitarian flights depart uh, different airports in Afghanistan, provided those departing had the proper paperwork, which meant either Afghan national ID cards or passports. All land borders are closed. The Pakistani border has been closed for over, almost two months now, which has had a deleterious effect on two things. One is the export of fruits, vegetables, and crops that the Taliban typically uh, exported to bring income into the country. And as well, this has hindered evacuation efforts. I estimate right now that there are over uh, 500,000 Afghan refugees living just across the border in Pakistan. And that number is most likely low, as well as hundreds of thousands in the three countries to the north, Turkmenistan, uh, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan. We are running into great difficulties in getting the last two last flights out of Afghanistan. We were successful in getting two a Airbus A340s out in the month of September because of the Taliban's commitment to letting these humanitarian flights fly and that there was no internal organization. The Department of State had also agreed to let these planes fly into uh, very, to 12 different United States controlled air bases around Europe and the Middle East. Unfortunately, right now, people are dying as they are attempting to get out of Afghanistan. And this is one of the greatest humanitarian tragedies in the history uh, of the world, let alone in the 21st century. Going forward, evacuation efforts are going to be greatly hindered. For example, the Department of State recently made the decision they would no longer accept Afghan passports, but that it had to be a biometric passport. Now, this was a, a random, capricious decision on the part of the Department of State because they are trying to walk away and walk back from any involvement with Pakistan, with Afghanistan. I think going forward, you're going to see uh, efforts on the part of Congress to support humanitarian flights as well as individual members of Congress. The Akani Network and the uh, internal, uh, the ISI are going to continually to heavily influence the Taliban. Pretty much nothing is happening inside Afghanistan that doesn't have the Akani family members or the ISI involved in decision making. One of the biggest problems they're facing right now is ISIS-K, because ISIS-K are made up of radical Islamic fundamentalists, and they do not support the Taliban. They're fighting an insurgency against the Taliban. There are also some other smaller groups that are fighting an insurgency, and this is destabilizing. On top of the drought, on top of the food crisis, on top of the banking crisis, the banks have pretty much folded because there's no currency. Women's rights are gone. Women no longer have the right to be educated or to hold any positions of authority in the government. Heroin is going to remain the number one export item for Afghanistan. And I expect that the export of, of heroin is going to grow significantly, probably by 30 to 50%. Foreign investment is not going to occur. I've had many people contact me and say, oh, China is going to be moving in immediately to take over Bagram Air Base and to uh, capitalize on all of the uh, natural resources that are under the ground in Afghanistan. I say not so fast. The reason is China's already had one bad experience in Afghanistan while the United States was occupying it. That had to do with a copper mine 
where they invested over $2 billion in the infrastructure to build this mine. The, they were, their workers were constantly being uh, uh, killed by snipers. Trucks going into and coming out of the copper mine were attacked. I think China is going to continue to investigate how they can make money and support themselves in Afghanistan, especially given that the world's largest lithium deposit is under the ground in Afghanistan. But I don't see them moving quickly uh, to capitalize on this. The biggest problem, infrastructure. There's no railroad. The paved roads are not being maintained. When the United States invaded, there were about 30 miles of paved road in Afghanistan. When the United States left, there were approximately 10,000 miles of paved road. Unfortunately, these roads have deteriorated over time. There's no upkeep and there's nobody there to, to maintain them. ISIS-K is now the biggest problem that the Taliban have. They are constantly setting off suicide bombs in mosques in front of government offices. And that's not going to go away anytime soon, if ever. Al Qaeda still exists in, in Afghanistan and will continue to exist. I don't know if they're going to have the ability to reach out and touch the United States from Afghanistan, but there's always that possibility. Afghanistan is in uh, an, an exigent need right now for foreign aid. As I said, their $20 billion GDP was made up of about 45% foreign aid. 100% of that has gone, evaporated. And they're finding it impossible to support their people, provide food, provide health care. And I don't see Western countries being eager to provide aid. Potentially, some could come from the United Nations or the World Bank, but I think that that is uh, very far off in the future. In closing, I'd like to put up a slide right now that has on it two pieces of information you may wish to write down. The first is my email address. As I indicated at the beginning, I have a distribution list to whom I send articles, I send opinion pieces created by other folks, and I send out analyses. Each of these pieces of information are vetted by me, and I have at least two sources for each piece that I send out. Analyses typically are triple vetted. Uh, if you would like to join this distribution list, send me an email to tshram at fuse.net, and uh, I will send you uh, a notification that you've been added to the list so that you can get this regular distribution of information that I send out. And that consists of three to say seven emails a week containing information I think is really important on geopolitical issues around the world. The other thing you may wish to write down is the website to make a contribution to the 22 member family that I've been working to get out ever since September 2nd. At this point in time, 15 of them are out of Afghanistan. Nine of them are at a lily pad outside of Philadelphia. The balance are still at a location in the Middle East being vetted by the United States, but they're at a location that's under United States control. And I still have eight people that are in Afghanistan awaiting evacuation. Uh, we are working very hard to get them out, but as time has gone on, the Department of State and the administration have managed to throw up more and more roadblocks for these humanitarian efforts. And uh, we are working diligently right now to get them out one way or another. Eventually, this family of 22, that I can't release their name right now because that would put them in the crosshairs of the Taliban, but this family of 22 will relocate to Beaverton, Oregon, where the, they have a relative. The family consists of a mother, 
three children, two sons and a daughter, and then grandchildren. Uh, one of the, the daughters lives uh, in Beaverton right now, used to be a NATO interpreter, and she is working with an American sponsor. We have about $17,000 that we've raised so far, and I would really encourage you to consider uh, doing one of two things, making a small contribution or large one if you can, and circulating this information to anyone you think might be interested and able to help in this effort. At this point, I'd be more than willing to take questions that you would have uh, about anything I've talked about or things that I haven't talked about. And you can do that through the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Kat, do you have any questions that have come in? Well, I think one of the most obvious questions that uh, you might have would be, what could the generals and our military have done differently so that we avoided an exit like we did in Vietnam? And my answer is they could have done one of two things. First, they could have put up a stronger fight against the Biden administration on maintaining a blocking force at Bagram Air Base. I think that was the most sensible thing that should have uh, occurred. That would have left us with an intelligence capability. And right now we have absolutely none. The other thing that should have happened and didn't happen in Vietnam and it did not happen here is that one or more of the people in the chain of command should have resigned. A high profile resignation on the part of the Secretary of Defense, our Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, or General McKenzie at Central Command would have resulted in the media paying more attention to the plan that was in place and, and asking some hard questions of the administration about what their plan was. This didn't happen. It didn't happen in Vietnam either. So there are a lot of similarities between our departure from Afghanistan and our departure from Vietnam. And I'll let you draw your own conclusions about that. Kat, um, I apologize. So I have, yes. So I have, we have about five additional questions and I apologize for the late. Uh, I was just collecting the information as we were speaking. So here's what we're going to go through as they come or as they came. So you just mentioned the, the star generals that what would have done. So with so much experience and insight, why did they accept the sudden withdrawal? Were they simply complacent or did they have any other, did not, did not have any choice um, or really have their position and status matter to them more rather than doing the right thing? I think that, I think two things. First off, they didn't have a choice about following orders. Every member of the United States military takes an oath of office to follow the orders of the President of the United States, the National Command Authority, and the officers that, that they report to. That's very clear. In, and that is in the fabric, very fabric of the United States military. As I said earlier, it is my humble opinion that someone should have fallen on their swords over this because of the poor planning. We just didn't have a plan to evacuate as quickly as we were asked to do so. And I have to lay, unfortunately, I have to lay that right at the feet of the administration. Uh, it didn't have to be that way. It could have gone differently. And had the chairman of the Joint Chiefs said, look, this is a bad plan. And rather than follow it, do what Secretary Mattis did before, which is say, you deserve to have someone serving you who is more in alignment with what you want to have done. And that's not me. That should have happened. I know it's easy for me to say 
because I'm not in the military and I'm not in that position. But that was the right thing to do in order to not lose faith for the people that we had over there and follow our no one left behind ethos. Those of us who have been in the military believe in that. And frankly, that's why we are willing to put ourselves in harm's way because we know that nobody's going to leave us behind. That's what I think should have happened. It didn't. The next question is somewhat connected to the first one. So assuming they would have had a choice, what would have been some of the actions and steps that our army could have done in order to postpone such a rush decision and then for do it properly and in stages? Well, it's my belief that we should have, we should have conducted all evacuation operations out of Bagram Air Base. There's a, a clear, <clears throat> clear barrier around Bagram Air Base where we can see and we could defend. Uh, Bagram Air Base has a 12, 000, had a 12,000 foot runway. It was a headquarters for our Special Operations Command for our intelligence gathering activities. I think that had we conducted the operations out of Bagram, it would have been a, a lot less chaotic than it was and we would have controlled the evacuation rather than the Taliban. Uh, I think that the departure of uh, US forces from Bagram was a terrible mistake. We should not have done that. Uh, had we stayed there, it would have been a much more orderly pro uh, progression and we could have conducted the evacuation over a number of months rather than just over the two weeks that we left ourselves. That's what Furthermore, I think could have happened. Furthermore, if we would have stayed, how long would have been able to remain or continue to be there? We could have stayed there indefinitely, but I think the uh, more reasonable projection would have been another two to four years with the force at Bagram gradually being reduced. But you have to remember one thing. We wanted to maintain an intelligence capability, intelligence gathering capability in Afghanistan on the terrorist groups that are in, in that country, and most notably Al Qaeda and ISIS. We can't gather intelligence from over the horizon sources. We've got to be on the ground. That's where real intelligence is gathered. You can only do so much electronically and with satellites uh, via imagery. And we lost that ability totally when we departed Bagram and departed Afghanistan. And I think that was a terrible uh, loss in terms of intelligence. We just, we, we have no ability at this point to gather intelligence on the ground, other than through people who still are still there and have cell phones and can communicate with us. That's our only ability. Uh, I think that's a terrible loss, given the, the uh, uh, activity over there and the violence that's going on and the retributions that are being made uh, and taken, uh, it's just not good. One of the questions that just came in asked, what will it happen to the drug addicts? How are they treated and handled by the new regime? It's a great question. I'm glad someone asked it. The Taliban hate the heroin. They hate the addicts. And in fact, they've begun rounding up some a very small percentage of the addicts, uh, making them shave their heads, shaving off their beards, putting them into uh, rehabilitation facilities. But again, their rehabilitation facilities are quite primitive. It's not like uh, in the Western countries where uh, they uh, have methadone and can gradually wean these people off of, of heroin. It's just cold turkey. And the, the addicts who are being rounded up are those who are making the mistake of begging for food, stealing. Uh, this is all forbidden under the Taliban's theocracy. And uh, they taking a very, they're taking a very hard line against heroin addicts when they find them. But they, the top level Taliban certainly do like the money that comes in. And it's a lot. And it does not get to the the Taliban soldiers who are, are enforcing the law on the streets. One last question. 
Pakistan has been officially and supposedly an ally of the US government for a long time. In this current case, why did US accept Pakistan's support and help of such a massive network of terrorist and Islamic extremists? Is that still the case after the withdrawal? And if not, what is the US government doing to address the issue of Pakistan helping the Taliban regime? And what are the steps that US or UN coalition are taking in order to force Pakistan in changing their stance? Well, here's a fundamental truth. And it can be debated, but I, I uh, opine that this is a fundamental truth that exists in that region. There's nothing we can do to change the position of Pakistan in terms of how they deal with the Taliban, the Akhani network in Afghanistan. And the main reason is the money. You can always follow the money. The control of Pakistan, it rests in the hands of the ISI and the Pakistani military. The Akhani network al operates almost autonomously up in the Northwest Territories, and they will continue to do so. Recently, the Deputy Secretary of State paid a, an official visit to Pakistan and took a very hard line with them about United States aid to Pakistan, which has been reduced considerably and will continue to be reduced. And there's a fundamental reason for that. Pakistan has been accepting a tremendous amount of foreign aid from China in the One Belt, One Road program. There's a lot of Chinese investment in Pakistan. Uh, the Pakistani Taliban are fighting against this. Uh, the Chinese are communists, and that goes against the basic teachings of Islam. Uh, and Pakistan is not a very friendly place right now. And uh, I don't see it becoming friendly. I don't see Pakistan coming around and agreeing to stop supporting the Akhani network and the Taliban. They didn't the entire time we were in Afghanistan. Uh, right now, they've got the best of all worlds, money from China. The opium trade has begun again, going, through the, the, going out through ships that depart uh, pa uh, Pakistani ports. I just don't see the fundamental chemistry of that region changing, even with threats from the United States. Well, only time will tell on this, and there'll be a historical perspective that people can look back at in five years and, and talk about what happened. I think we're still too close to it, but I don't see it changing, unfortunately. I would like to, so this concludes our presentation for the day. I wanted to um, thank all participants and the people who have been able to make for this special presentation on Afghanistan. Once again, for more information on the Foreign Policy Leadership Council, you can go to our website, fplcohio.org. And also you can address and connect with Tom directly through via his uh, email, tshram at fuse.net. Again, tshram at fuse.net. With that said, I would like to thank everybody for, for the time. Thank you, Tom, for the generous amount of, of time that you've given us for the presentation, for the exceptional information, and hope to see you next time. Thank you.